When we think of the 23rd Psalm, we think of green pastures and cute lambs. This Psalm has been a source of comfort to generations of Christians and is almost as well known as the Lord's Prayer. But perhaps we need to rescue truth from familiarity. In the last session, we reflected on the metaphorical theologian. Now we will observe such a theologian at work. We're ready now to look again at the 23rd Psalm and pick up our reflection on the various parts of the Psalm, each little section I prefer to call cameos that fit together into a marvelous whole. And the form of them is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1. That form I have called the prophetic rhetorical template because it is so common. We have it here in this Psalm. The opening phrase, as we noted, reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This doesn't have the kind of a cutting edge that it really should have for us. Because the minute anyone moves out of the inhabited areas of the Holy Land into the open desert areas or the steppe of the wilderness, they are on their own. No one is going to come after them. The first time I really understood what this is all about was living during the Lebanese Civil War of, in, in Beirut for, that lasted for 17 years. My family and I were there for the first 10 years, and the electricity was off, and the government had collapsed, and the army had fallen apart, and the police were no longer patrolling the streets. The telephones didn't work. Every man had a gun. The city was controlled by 150 private militias and uh, the courts were all closed and the prisons were all opened. It was a very interesting place to live. And I knew that the minute I walked out of my house on any given morning to take the 15 minute walk to the seminary where I was teaching, that I would go in and out of territory controlled by three different armed militias and all of them could shoot me and if they did there was no phones and no one would call to tell my good wife that I was no longer in this life. And you walked out of the house with that sense of the Lord is my shepherd. I've got nothing to be worried about because it's going to be okay. David had a pretty tough life. He went through wars, he had a dysfunctional family, he had his own son came in rebellion against him and he had to be killed so that the revolt could be over. I mean, his, 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 the world of what he lived in was a mess. He says so. You read some of the Psalms in which he's talking about how many people are against him and he can't find friends anywhere. Uh, Psalm 50, roughly to 55, is loud and clear about his tremendous feeling of uh, being alone and isolated and people against him that, whom he didn't really even, didn't even know who they were, even friends were against him. May have been suffering from depression. But he writes this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The next cameo, the next little section, leads is about the sheep and the shepherd and it says we read it traditionally he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters i was puzzled about this for some time because a sheep 
is, is a kind of an animal that you can't make it lie down. A dog, you can train it to sit, and when you tell it to sit, it will. But a sheep, no, you can't do it. If it has enough to eat and enough to drink, and there's no wild dogs or hyenas barking in the distance, and no insects are uh, working on its nose, then okay, it'll lie down and chew the cud and relax, get a bit of rest, hopefully in the shade. You can't make it do that. The verb allows us to translate, as some of our uh, commentators and translations have also suggested, he settles me down or he lets me lie down in green pastures. I spent 10 years halfway between Bethlehem and Jerusalem teaching at an ecumenical institute. And of course, in the Holy Land, the rain comes starting in November, if you're lucky. You get rain in December, January, by February it's gone. And no more rain for the, until you come around to the next November. So if it rains in November, then by December you start to get a bit of green grass. And from January you've got good green grass. February is beautiful, lots of nice stuff. From March on, nothing but brown dead grass. The gardener of the institute where I taught came to work every day on his donkey. He tied his donkey up outside my study door where I had my office and my study. And uh, I felt very good about this little donkey for about three months a year because he had some nice green stuff that he could chomp on. But from March on, I started feeling sorry for him, especially by the end of summer. All he could do was just stand there in the heat and blink. There was nothing to eat. So green pastures for most, for most of us are the only kind of pastures there are. No, the word can also be translated succulent pastures, which of course are green. It means the best food. And he leads me beside the still waters. We're not quite sure why, but sheep will not drink from water when it's moving. Uh, perhaps they're afraid that they will lose their footing and there might be some deep water there which they can't see because the water's moving, and if they fall into that deep water, the water's going to get into their wool, and they'll be heavy, and the weight will of the water and the wool will pull them under the surface of the water, and in one minute or two minutes, they will drown. It may be that instinctively they know this. We're not sure. In any case, they won't drink from water that moves. The shepherds know this, and so if they're going to a stream, they will dig a little kind of a dead-end a uh, trough off from the side of the stream and the water stops and it's still and the sheep will approach and they will drink. Or if the shepherd is getting water out of a well or out of a cistern, there will be a trough either carved and brought there out of stone or dug out of the rock or built up with rocks and with cement and the shepherd will pour the water into that trough, and sure enough, then the sheep can drink. So we're talking now about the best food and the water that we can drink. He leads me. Yeah, well, we've got shepherds that all they really do is kind of look around. They take rocks and they throw it at the sheep that are at the back, get them to hurry up. I've seen that actually last week. I was in Israel, Palestine, and where I was staying, I was in a position to look out and I watched some shepherds go by and sure enough, that's what he did. He had a few loose rocks and when some of the sheep got a little bit slow, why he threw a rock and they would kind of put their heads up and they would quickly run after the rest of the flock. But the really classic good shepherd doesn't do that. He has a call. Either he plays a tune on a pipe or he sings a little ditty. The little ditties sound something like this. That's enough. The sheep recognize the voice, probably the voice more than the tune, but the tune helps because I have records of 19th century travelers 
in which three or four shepherds come together at one spring and they decide it's time to move out. And so the shepherds, each of them say, tau, 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 which is a Lebanese colloquial shortening of the word dailu. And it means, come here, come here, come here. Well, all three shepherds are giving the same call, so and it's not a tune. They recognize the voice. The tune helps. So he's out front, walking slowly. Once the shepherd gets the flock to a place where there's something to eat, he walks slowly in front of them. And about every minute, I've timed them because I've watched them go by in places where my family and I were having picnics up in the Lebanese mountains. And the sheep nibble, 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 hear the call and start to follow. And pretty soon the call is getting fainter and fainter and you start worried about the half a dozen sheep that are still around you. And all of a sudden they come to and they panic. They run around making a lot of noise. Where did you guys go and nobody told me you were leaving and it's not my fault? They hear the call and they take off running like a shot. It's beautiful to watch. We've got stories of the British in the 20s and in the 30s when they ruled Palestine of rounding up all of the animals of a particular village because the village was giving them trouble. A little boy comes and says, I've got to have my five goats because that's the only protein for my widowed mother and myself. And the sergeant says, look, Sonny, we're taking care of your animals. We'll get this all sorted out in a couple of days. We'll, and we'll, we're, they're being well fed. Come back and you can have your animals in a couple of days. And he says, no, being a Middle Easterner, he knows that the word N-O isn't an answer. It's a pause in the negotiations. So he continues to negotiate. Finally, the sergeant in frustration says, what do you want me to do, kid? And the little boy says, open the gate. Sergeant, OK. He opens the gate. What does the kid do? Takes his pipe out of his pocket. He plays his little tune. His five goats come out of this herd of a couple of thousand animals and to the amazement of the sergeant, follows him down the road. That's the way the system works. Here is the good shepherd who gives me the finest food. He gives me the water that I can drink. And he leads me gently with his call. And I follow that gentle call. The next little cameo, number three, tells us, and we have translated, thou restoreth my soul. This is so strong in the tradition. Here's a classic case in which a concrete image has been turned into an abstraction in the way we have translated it. No, the Hebrew says, Yeshubib nefshi. Yeshubib is an intensive form of the great Hebrew word shub, which means to return or to repent. And here it's in an intensive form. And nefshi means myself. Literally translated, we've got two options. One is we can translate it, he brings me back, which is the classic way that it has always been translated in Syriac and Arabic in the Middle East. Middle Eastern Christians have always read it that way. Or we can translate it, he causes me to repent. In any case, the shepherd knows perfectly well that sheep, once it finds that it's lost, will not be able to go anywhere. All it can do is crawl under a bush and start bleeding. He's got to get there quickly before some wild animal hears it and comes after it. Now, keep in mind the discovering that the sheep is lost and the shepherd has to go after it happens late in the afternoon. Because that's when you've, they've had enough to eat, they've sat in the shade, they've gotten a drink, now it's time to go home and either back to the village or to a cave or to an enclosure that the shepherds themselves would build and the shepherd sleeps across the entrance and he can put his stick across it and they have to go in one at a time and he can count them. Whoop, hey, one's lost. We should have 100, we've only got 90 and nine. What are we gonna do now? Quick, you call to your friends and somebody takes care of the flock and off you go, hoping to find it before dark. You have a lamp, it's not very bright, and it's 
very, very dangerous. You can't see that well, and you're in a hurry. The discovery of the lost, the desperate search, and the struggle back with the animal, which is too traumatized to be able to walk. And we are talking about the task of the shepherd who becomes an agent of salvation. And why does he do it? We're told he does it for his own namesake. This is very important to notice. On the story level, the shepherd says to himself, I never lost a sheep. My father never lost a sheep. My grandfather not, never lost a sheep. And I'm going to find that miserable beast if it kills me. Because I'm not going to be known in the village as the kind of a man who is careless and loses his sheep. I'm going to find it. We're talking about now the integrity of God. When you ask the prophets, the classic writing prophets, why does Israel, why does God care about Israel when Israel is wayward and starts worshiping idols? Jeremiah and Hosea say God comes after us because he loves us. But Ezekiel, the prophet of the exile, says, no, you have worshipped too many idols, and whatever love God has from you has already been used up, but he is going to come after you anyway. He will do it for his own namesake. It is because of his own integrity that he will come after us. His own inner integrity can be described as his holiness. And his love is a word which we understand. And when we put the two together, we can talk about holy love. And when Jesus comes to the cross in the 17th chapter of John, 16th, 17th chapter of John, the, the sayings in the upper rooms, he addresses God as, O Holy Father. The two come together in a marvelous way in the theology of the cross. So here we have the love and holiness, both of which are in this psalm. The holiness we have just seen, the inner integrity, he does it for his own namesake. And at the end of the psalm, we'll find that mercy, love, follows us all the days of our life. Now, our translation, as I've mentioned, has usually translated this, thou restoreth my soul, which isn't wrong. That's part of it. But it really kind of dumbs it down to Monday morning. I really had kind of a tough weekend. I wasn't ready to go to work, but I said a little prayer and spent a little time in scripture. Uh, perhaps if I had opportunity, attended the Eucharist and I was aid the, the depression of my soul was lifted and I managed to get into the car and drive away and go to work. This says a lot more than that, and it's not always been lost. Way back, St. Columba, from the 6th century, when he wrote the great hymn, which we know as the king of love my shepherd is, no doubt you know it, and the third verse reads as follows, perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. There we go. Sixth century, the church has always, at least back that far, known that this is talking about a lost sheep and about a shepherd who pays the price to go after it and pays an even greater price to get it home. All right, we're ready now for the climax of the psalm. In our minds, the climax is always at the end because our minds move in logical sequence. So that if A is true, then B is true, and if B is true, then C is true, and we march our way through whatever it is we're discussing. But quite often, the prophets and the authors of the New Testament use ring composition. 
a series of ideas that come to a climax and then repeat backwards. A very, very simple case of this is where Jesus says no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Number one and number six are two masters. Number two and number five are hate. And love is mentioned twice in the middle. Did you catch it? No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Two masters hate love. Love, hate, two masters. Where is the climax? In the middle, we're talking about the love to the one master. The climax is not at the end, it's in the center. That's what we have here in this psalm, which is also constructed using ring composition. And so what do we read? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Yeah, this can be translated valley of deep, deep darkness. The meaning is the same regardless of which way you translate it. We'll stick with the traditional. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death on the story side, there are places in the Holy Land where water has cut a very deep valley and you can only, it's quite narrow at the bottom. I've seen them, I've walked through some of them. The shepherds are always nervous about these places because thieves and brigands can get up at the top and drop large rocks down on the sheep and they can knock out the shepherd and steal whatever they like. And quite often there are wild animals at the end or waiting at the beginning. They're places of considerable fear. So we're told that there is the shadow of death and there is the question of evil. We're not told you're going to escape death and you're going to escape evil. We're told that neither sin nor death frightens me. The fear is gone. Now, we as Christians, I think, have the right to read this through the light of what we have known in Christ. We have died with him, and we have been raised with him in resurrection, thereby been there, done that. We have already been through that dark valley and a part of his victory is already our victory and thereby the fear is gone. The people who do not have that fear taken from them are the people who live with that constant dread of sin and death. We, as Christians, are not among them. So what do we read next in number five? We're told, you are with me, your rod and staff, they comfort me. Notice, you are with me is another way of saying God is with me, and it's another way of saying Emmanuel, God with us. David senses in some way he cannot define that God is already profoundly present with him. We are discussing incarnation. Now, why is it that he's not afraid? And why is it that he senses that God can handle this? He looks at the shepherd and he sees the shepherd has two instruments. One instrument is the staff. You've got a marvelous picture of a shepherd uh, in the Middle East with a staff, only this is not the usually. Usually the staff has a little bit of a bend on the end, and the shepherd climbs with his staff, and he wants a bend on the end because he can hook a lamb that slipped down into the stream somewhere and get it out by hooking it around the neck or around one of the legs or around the waist and get it back out. Or if it gets hung up, on a 
cliff somewhere and can't get down, he can kind of grab it and it can kind of get it back down on the path. A very useful instrument in keeping the flock on the path. And the other part is the rod. The rod is about this long and it's got a big uh, head on it, usually made out of a young nut tree that is cut down and the root mass is dug up but then it's, it's shaved off and then you get the blacksmith to put some very heavy pieces of iron in it and it becomes a rod of iron which is mentioned two or three times in the Old Testament. That phrase isn't talking about a crowbar. You can't do anything with a crowbar. But if you've got some big iron pieces into the head of this mace, you can clobber a wild animal over the head and at least knock it out. David says that he fought a lion, grabbed it by the beard. I'm not sure I really want to do that, but he did. Now, how did he attack it? It wasn't with his sling, for heaven's sakes. This is too close. He took his mace and he cracked it over the head, knocked it out, then he takes his knife and he's able to kill it. That's the way you manage with the wild animals. I, the sheep, look at the shepherd and I know that those two instruments, one is to protect me from the outside, the wild animals, and the second is to keep me on the right path, the path of righteousness. So one will help me internally with my life with the, with the sheep, and the other will protect me from the outside. I know my shepherd house knows how to use these instruments, and thereby I know that all will be well if I follow him. We then shift to something very important. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil my cup overflows. Some people have tried to turn this into a verse about uh, shepherds. It really isn't. It's about a banquet. It, it falls on, thou preparest a table. Well, yes, there's table land up in Switzerland and down in Kenya. But I lived in the, middle, in the Holy Land for 10 years. There isn't any table land at all. And so that really doesn't make any sense. It talks of what it's all about is you, O oh Lord, prepare a banquet for me, even though it's not popular to do so. I have enemies that won't like you when you do this. This is <clears throat> the father in the parable of the prodigal, knowing that the older son is going to get mad. And the prodigal could say to his father at the banquet, Father, you have prepared for me a banquet in the presence of mine enemies. There are people in this village who don't like me because I took the money and because I lost it and because I came back in rags. But you have prepared a banquet for me anyway. A great, rich image important that calls upon us to reflect deep and long. But aha, thou preparest. Now the word thou is masculine. But to prepare a table means to prepare a meal. Now, who do you think prepared the meals in the ancient Middle East? The men or the women? Guess. Give it your best shot. The women, of course. Abraham has a banquet. Three guests show up. He wants to give them a nice meal. What does he do? He goes to his wife and says, you've got to bake some fresh bread. And then he goes and gets a nice animal out of the flock and he gives it to his servants. And he said, you take care of this and butcher the thing and cook it because we want fresh bread and some nice fresh uh, meat for these guests. He doesn't do it. He has staff. They take care of these things. Now, the word is masculine, thou. But here we have this masculine thou is doing the work of a woman. The shepherd is male and now that Shepherd, now this host is doing the work of a female. God is neither male nor female. But God has created all of us and thereby the characteristics of male and female that we know in the male and female about us come from the one who has created them and this is God himself. Thou anointest 
my head with oil. We'll have to trace and look and see what happens to that female component to this collection of ideas. In fact, it disappears. Thou anointest my head with oil, usually a perfumed oil. I've had this done for me. You pours on your head, you kind of wipe it down like this. Kind of makes you feel like something very special is being done for you. My cup overflows. This is definitely a great banquet. And finally, at the end, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for the length of the days. Whose days? If it's God's days, you're going to translate forever. If it's our days, you're going to translate my life long. How about leaving it the way the David wrote it, which is the way our Arabic and Syriac versions have always left the text. The days, for the length of the days. God's days and my days. And what does this mean? This means that I'm now a part of a flock. When we come home at night, there are wolves and hyenas back there, hoping that one of the sheep gets sick or has been injured and will lag behind and then they will be able to make a quick kill. No. I have the goodness and the chesed, the covenant faithfulness and the love of God that surround me and follow me and protect my back. And that's how this psalm ends. Amen.